Whenever I say I'm from Alabama, people seem to want to ask what it was like to hold that fire hose. If I ever had to answer, I'd tell them I was born the day that happened. They seem to want to ask what it was like to bomb that church and kill those little girls. I was born that day as well. I was born the day they marched across the Edmund Pettus Bridge, the day Wallace made his stand, the day Martin had his dream, the day he saw the mountaintop, and the day after that. I was born innocent, free of all the blood shed that day, but I was born into blood. I still am washing from my hands. It's one thing for me to be racist, but it's quite another thing for the structure of our society to be racist. I think that what we've done is very so. And I think it's important to, to recognize difference because difference makes us who we are. We still have a long ways to go. How can you have racism without racists? I mean, it's going to require us to dig. Whenever you dig, there's going to be some work, right? There's going to be some pain. Race is uh, still uh, the defining feature of Alabama society. Uh, it's hard to identify anything that matters more than race to most people. Uh, I think that there are all kinds of presumptions that we make about each other uh, based on race. Uh, I think that there is still a very uh, tragic uh, sense of who is better and who is not uh, that is heavily influenced by race. I think we have a lot of doubts, a lot of distrust, and a lot of fear that is organized primarily around race. And until we deal with it, it will just grow. Race is still such a huge predictor of how life is going to turn out for somebody. And it's not the only predictor that's true. Economics is important, and your gender matters, and your sexuality matters, and where you're born exactly matters. But what color you are and what your racial identity is really matters a lot. It's still very hard uh, to facilitate the kind of honest conversations that I think are necessary when it comes to race. We don't like talking about race. And that's as true today as it was uh, 40 years ago, as it was 80 years ago. As W.E.B. Du Bois said, uh, that the 20th century would deal with the color line. Well. The 20th century, the 21st century, we have never adequately dealt with the color line. I think we have to be willing to um, look even more squarely in the eye of racial inequality if we're ever to do away with it. Um, sometimes I'll, I'll say that we have to illuminate racism in order to eliminate racism. There's really uh, no way that you could factually say that race does not matter because it does in just about everything. Running away from the discussion is not actually going to make the problem go away. If that were true, I would actually say let's not talk about it because that then we would be on our way to actually having um, equal opportunity and not wasting so much of the potential that is uh, living in communities of color. 
but not talking about it has not taken us to the place where it doesn't matter. I'm, I'm not exactly sure that we've sat down and, and, and talked about what's important to us uh, as Mobilians, you know, what's important enough to us that would transcend race. In my opinion, this town is kind of polarized. Um, we give the appearance that everything is fine, but underneath, it's really not. We've got a long way to go. I'm not convinced that we have come so far. I think that what we've done is buried so deep. We've covered up a lot, you know. And I think that uh, a lot of us live in a state of pretense as to how things really are. I think our problem is we really haven't admitted that we ever had any racial difficulties in Mobile. And I think that's true of both African Americans and whites. It frankly was not until I graduated from high school and went to college and then worked in the professional arena that I began to understand that race still plays an important role in who gets listened to and who gets jobs and what types of jobs you may get and in, and in who considers you a viable uh, person to make progression within an organization. I think we could do a better job of discussing race in every aspect of Alabama culture. I expect it as part of our educational system because uh, I know Alabama, Alabama whites don't like it. I know that they would rather live in a different time and a different place. Uh, uh, many Alabamians enjoy the 19th century so much that they'd like to preserve it right into the 21st century. We live in a multicultural world. Get over it. <laughs> uh, Alabama is a state that still fiercely, in too many quarters, holds on to an Old South uh, reputation. We don't like the identity of New South. We like the identity of Old South. Uh, we don't want to kind of back away uh, from this legacy uh, that is very painful and difficult uh, for communities of color. Uh, and that representation, I think, is problematic. Uh, for many people of color, whether we like it or not, these images of the Confederacy, these images of resistance to integration are very powerful. And if we don't deal with the representation, we're not going to deal with what's underneath that. We've never asked ourselves, is the property tax provision of the 1901 Constitution any less racist? Is the motivation any less clearly racist than the attempt to disfranchise blacks? And my answer is an historian, and the answer of the vast majority of Alabama historians who've looked at this issue is, no, it's the very same issue. The same Constitution that gave us the poll tax, that gave us the literacy test, that gave us apartheid, also gave us the present tax system. When we look at the over-incarceration of African-American people, when we look at the fact that there are enormous rates of homicide, when we look at health care disparities, when we look at the disparities between education, for suburban white kids and inner city black and brown kids, then we know that in America, despite the symbols of tremendous success, there's also the resistance to the kind of social change that those exceptional black people betoken. Even Barack Obama, the most famous and most powerful person in the world, regardless of race, as the occupant of the White House and the Oval Office, is subject to vicious forms of assault and resistance when you look at what happens with the Tea Party and the birthers and the like. We have an African-American president. You don't have to be a Democrat or a Republican necessarily to think you know, that's a good thing or a bad thing, but it says something about the fact that you know, this state um, had the lowest percentage of white voters supporting this African-American president than any other state in the country. We have a black president, sure. We have a black president in this country. And we look at the situation and we say, how far, how far have we gone? How far have race relationships come in the last few years? Well, we've closed the gap in some areas. We've closed the gap in some areas. And still, if you look at some things, we still have a long ways to go. We still have a long ways to go. Even though a lot of it is unspoken, um, you know, if you're African-American especially, 
um, you learn to be watchful. And sometimes out of that watchfulness, you see things that are disappointing that let you know that veil is still there. Um, you know, I have a PhD, but sometimes when I go out my door, that veil is still there for me. Oftentimes, I'm in situations where race becomes a topic of conversation between myself and a white individual or a group of, of white people. And they go, but Carlos, you're different. You're not like most black people that we know. And they mean it in the most complimentary of ways. But it's offensive. It's offensive because I am like a whole lot of black people. I think it's helpful when we're thinking through how racism manifests itself. When we have failings in race relations, what to do about them. I think it's helpful not just to consider that in terms of individual relationships and the way each of us individually treat someone else. Because there are structural barriers that find themselves disproportionately based in black communities that need addressing at a structural level at a justice level. We Western moderns, we Americans, who are very much self-interested, we are highly individualistic. I think that when we talk about sin, we think that means my sin, the little naughty things that I do, all about me. The word for sin in the Gospel of John is harmartia, which best translated in the Koine Greek means collective brokenness. That's quite a different matter. Sin that finds its way insidiously into the social structure of our world, into the fabric of our society, often unnoticed. Um, it's one thing for me to be racist, but it's quite another thing for the structure of our society to be racist. In so many of our institutions around, you have one. If you raise the issue about race, they can point to that one and say, Oh, we're doing a great job. You should meet whatever his name is or her name is. And, and they're the person who is carrying the load of diversity. They are, they are the diversity within that institution. We may be given titles and positions and offices. Or when we have visitors, we are part of the decor um, showing that you know, yeah, we do have blacks in our midst. I'm talking about getting to a point where we say, okay, we're going to stop singling out the one that we can put up as the example of what we're doing. But until we recognize that that is a problem, that that model is a problem, that that model is continuing to make people feel left out, that they sit around and try to figure out, how do I get to be the anointed one? Rather than feeling like there's a level playing field and that if I go in and I work hard and I do well, that I can aspire for anything in that company. You know, it bothers me when I hear people fix their mouth and say, they try to use the word Bama in a derogatory way. When they say Bama, they say, well, epitomize being black and from the South. Now, I'll be that. But let me explain to you what being a Bama really about. You see, Alabama was known as the heart of Dixie because that's what black folks always had at heart. I'm from Mobile down here by the bay, and this was the main A order. And from Jim Crow to slavery, we carried too much of this water to be disrespected by the very people who supplied the fuels of our martyrs. Were they drinking from the well of freedom provided by our great grandmothers and fathers? Knowing the whole time it was Alabama that made life better for them, their sons, and their daughters. So you hate on Alabama in the South, you're really blocking what was your own blessings. Peep game, Huggy gonna give you a quick history lesson. Now if you was black in this country, no matter where you're from, some degree you always had a hassle. But when cotton was king, Alabama was the castle. Fertile land, Pope City, plus a whole bunch of slaves, so they made a square amount of money off that triangle trade. Now 1876 ended what they call post-Civil War Reconstruction. 
Last of the Union troops left the South, and the KKK went on the path of destruction. And that sparked the first migration, the exodus. Blacks heading toward the Mason-Dixie line. Couldn't take the way they were being treated in the South, so they left everything they ever loved and knew behind. But the irony of the situation is, most of them got up North, weren't treated too much better. Disenfranchised, segregated, underpaid. Now they got to deal with that cold, cold weather. So eventually over time in the South, what you pretty much had left was the strongest, most oppressed, hardest working people on this planet, searching for knowledge and worth for self. And they wouldn't let us go to their colleges. So we start our own HBCUs. Mr. Payne of our struggle with our Negro spirituals and created this new music called blues. And it was Bama's like W.C. Handy that gave it to the world to use. They never understood the pain of our struggle till we made them sing and dance in our shoes. Then down in New Orleans, some old Bama types created jazz. And people had never heard nothing like it before. And it spread around the world real fast. It had so much power, so much energy that anybody could feel it. And them scary Negroes that ran north, let the record company steal it. But meanwhile, down in Montgomery, it was some Bamas that had enough. So they stepped off on a good foot and the whole city stopped riding the bus. And some Bamas over in Selma and Birmingham started doing some similar things. And they were led by a Bama preacher, but we call him Dr. Martin Luther King. And it was him and a whole bunch of other Bamas like Mega Evers that fought and died for all our civil rights endeavors. It was Bamas that suffered the most that have changed this world. Them Little Rock Nine and them four little girls. From Dred Scott to the Montgomery bus boycott, we indebted to some Bamas for all we got. Who taught us to struggle? Who made us yearn to be free? If it weren't for some Bamas, what would black folks really be? Now ultimately, you're gonna believe what you wanna believe. But when it comes to music, art, culture, sports, whatever, recognize what we didn't achieve. If you don't believe a word I'm saying, you can check every one of my facts. Then while you're at it, go and ask your grandmama where she learned to cook like that. So in closing, I'm going to stay Alabama the beauty. Hard-working country swag, crusty feet, and dirty cubes. Born and bred in this red dirt clay, and it was the blood of my ancestors that made it that way. So till you get some rosewood, some cold facts, or some Tuskegee experiments, you need to start using that word Bama like a term of endearment. And if survival is determined by the strength of your genes, or you keep your Sean Johns, I'm going to roll with my dungarees. That's Bama. We have eliminated the daily threats associated with uh, racial violence. We have eliminated uh, most forms of the kind of legal uh, segregation that characterized uh, Alabama in the, the 1900s. Um, and in that regard, we've made tremendous progress, tremendous progress. A and you now see things that 50 years ago would have been unimaginable, elected black officials and uh, uh, people uh, going to school together, uh, doing things socially together, going into any part of any community together. And that's a dramatic progress. It's progress only because things are so bad. In a sort of an ordinary society, you wouldn't think that that is some big measure of progress. But it is real progress here that I think has to be acknowledged when we talk about things like race relations. In my opinion, as an historian of the state, uh, race is still the defining single issue in our politics, in our society, in our popular culture. So it's less of a defining issue. There are less rabid on both sides of the issue, but it's still the defining issue in Alabama politics. But I also think that in the last 20 years, um, the effort, the interest, the commitment uh, to continue improving race relations has really uh, leveled. And there is a growing indifference to talking about race, thinking about race in critical contexts and appreciating the need for continuing reform on race. And I think that means we're moving backward in some areas. Mobile is a, in a lot of ways is a, is a Southern city and it does have that legacy of racism and segregation and white supremacy that, uh, that you know, we're slowly shedding, but we need to make sure we understand that past well enough that we don't repeat it. Well, the history here in this city is uh, to, 
to some extent, I think, a, a history of um, almost denial. There was this uh, belief here that the system of race relations worked uh, just fine. You didn't see the kind of episodes that, uh, of, of violence that uh, occurred in Birmingham in 63 and, and Montgomery in, in, in 1961 with the Freedom Riders. And then uh, in, in Selma at Edmund Pettus Bridge, those kinds of episodes didn't take place. Well, people in Mobile go, well, that's because you know, we, we know how, how we can all get along. And, and, and black folks were uh, accepted that system and, and white folks accepted that system. We had people who uh, would work with John LaFleur and, uh, and, and, and make incremental changes. But those were incremental changes designed uh, it, it seems to me, anyway, uh, to maintain a l largely a system of, of segregation with enough changing uh, to keep people basically satisfied on both sides of the racial divide. I think if we hadn't been forced, uh, white Southerners had not been forced to integrate their schools by the federal government, had not been forced to treat people with equity regardless of race, creed, color, religion, and so on. I don't think we ever would have gotten around to it, at least not in my lifetime. It appears that Mobile never really had a struggle. People said, we can do this, let's just get along. And so the frank conversation about the differences that we bring with race were never had. People never had that opportunity to speak frankly, clearly, genuinely to each other about the role those differences play in who we are and how we behave. And so now it's almost like we pretend they're not there and we just try to move forward and do what we need to do, but we pretend that the differences don't exist. Well, one black woman said to me, Peggy, whites feel too much about race. And your gift is that you think about race. And can't you get more whites to think about race? And she was talking about the way I had, in a ver very kind of flat-footed way, listed 46 ways in which I have unearned advantage by contrast with my African-American friends. I was hearing their stories with this empathetic feeling, how terrible for them. I was never feeling how exempt for me, how exempt for me to be able to assume the police are my friends. Once I saw <laughs> that above this hypothetical line of justice, they're pushed down by not being able to depend on the police but I am pushed up by having their exclusive attention to my needs and my well-being as they see it. And that changed everything. Some people think that racism is simply a matter of personal hatred of one person for another with a color boundary between. But I think the real racism, the one that needs to be talked about more, is the one in which all of your values that you have taken in through your life those values themselves are, they're looking at that boundary and they're policing it and they're, re, they're reinforcing it. And so it's always going to be accompanied by denial because what people don't realize is it's not a matter of personal volition alone. It's also a matter of living in a world that enables you to deny it and also have the privileges of being on one side of that line and not the other. One of the ways that I have found helpful and kind of working through all of this is to recognize that I am raced, that white is a race. White is not the norm. We are actually part of what is a social construction and should be treated in that way. Most people who study this say race is a social construction. It, it's a practice that we actually put into place through social norms and practices. It is not a biological marker. Uh, that's very different. 
Now, some people take that message in, to mean that race is not real. If it's not biologically grounded, then it's not real. That's not what that message means. It means it's, it may be a scientific or biological fiction. It's a social reality. Uh, and so we need to think about what are we doing? What are the practices? What are the norms? What are the institutions doing? That's not just distributing benefits and burdens based on race. That's also distributing identity based on race. One of the things we were attempting to answer in the 20th century is what does it mean to be human? Not what does it mean to be black or white or Latino, you know, or, or brown or, or Asian or gay or, or, or lesbian. I mean, all of that came within the, the context of it, but if you are all of that, what does it mean finally to be human? Whether someone is a racist or not, and, and you know, actually it's a good thing if someone objects to being called a racist. And we might say, well, there are secret races, there are closet races. But it shows that, again, there's a public value to not being a racist. It's morally uh, uh, reprehensible to some people to be called a racist. So it's a threat to their sense of themselves. Now, they may, in fact, still be engaged in activity that has racialized outcomes. There may be unconscious biases that they're not aware of. So the question of whether or not they're racist, in many instances, is not relevant. Beverly Tatum put it uh, beautifully where it's almost like um, being on a moving sidewalk at the airport. You're either going to walk on that moving sidewalk, which means that you're intentionally, actively racist. There are others, and this is where the vast majority of people fall in, um, who stand on the moving sidewalk. You're not actively pursuing any kind of racial intent. You're just standing on the moving sidewalk, and you're just rolling on with it unintentionally, but you're just moving in that direction. And then there are all those who are actively anti-racist, who are kind of speaking out, where you're actually walking the other way on the moving sidewalk. And you know, you have to walk twice as fast, and that work is twice as hard, because you're, 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 you're working against an ideology that's out there. Because what's comfortable is to stand on the doggone thing. I think it's been unfortunate and a mistake to put the conversation about racial disparities in terms of what is owed to one race. In other words, it's almost a tone of a charitable requirement for the black community. Black people don't need charity. Their children need good schools the way any child needs a good school. Their children don't need handouts. They need medical attention from prenatal care forward. And when you frame it that way to white people or black people, Republicans or Democrats, you get large majorities agreeing at that. A lot of us are contributing with our minds. And I often wonder, you know, even when I look at my own family and look at the wasted potential of so many people in my family, what would have been different if somebody had inspired them and, and expected them to do more? Where would we be in science? Where would we be in the arts? Um, where would we be as a country? We got to start enacting what we say. And I, and I think we're kind of, I mean, I, I'm thinking of T.S. Eliot's quote, between the idea and the reality falls the shadow. And I think we live, I think we're still in that shadow between idea and making that idea become flesh. I don't know what the future of race relations is going to be in America. I know it's going to be um, a central problem in American life uh, for generations to come. I know that. I know Americans have got to be uh, aware of how central it is to uh, their national identity, but how they're going to deal with it whether they're going to deal with it. I don't know that. I think it would be just be willing to listen uh, to what um, many people of color are saying and thinking about these issues. I think there tends to be, oh, you're black, you've got that black talk thing going, I'm not even going to pay attention to that, and we immediately shut down. Uh, it's like black people talking about race don't even listen. And, you know, I think I would just encourage people to just for a moment, kind of as a thought experiment, 
to appreciate some of what's being said, to appreciate why it's being said, to think about uh, what is motivating that, and be willing to just, just consider uh, that uh, there may be some need for progress, for reform, for discussion, for dialogue. Um, we've gotten so reactionary uh, on this issue that I don't think we even ever get to the point of dialogue. It's just sort of people shouting and screaming and you know, moving away. The reason we need a conversation on race, the reason we need teachers in Alabama public schools to talk about race, the reason we need churches to have conversations about race is because if you've got a problem, there are two ways you can handle the problem. The dangerous way that never resolves a problem, never moves us forward, and just leaves all the scar tissue and all the pain behind is just to pretend it doesn't exist. Or you can front it head on and deal with it and resolve it and move on. From my own life, I have been able to see many, many communities that when they were willing to look explicitly at the question of race, when they were willing to look at all of their systems and really think through how can this system help bring people together, how can this system do the same, and not just help people come together in their own minds, but help people come together in life, like be living in the same neighborhoods, be working in the same workplaces, be going to the same schools, that that is a project that will have many, many rewards. I was born innocent, free of all the blood shed that day. But I was born into blood. I still am washing from my hands. That last stanza is it, isn't it? I mean, that when you're born into history, you can't help the inheritance of the past, only the future, only what you do with that inheritance, which begins, I think, in reckoning with it. Mm -hmm.